that? All right, can you guys hear me all right? Hello, hello. Hello. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and dig in, so if you could quiet down, I'd appreciate it. Uh, while I'm talking, I'm going to have the 3DR Solo up here running, connected to the transmitter. Uh, so if you guys want to mess around with it, I'm not going to tell you specifically how, but you can poke around on my Twitter and, and other stuff like that and figure it out fairly trivially. Uh, I'd like to fly this this weekend, so I'd prefer if you don't RM it or do anything too messed up. But uh, again, feel free to you know, de-auth it, try to crack the Wi-Fi password, um, SSH into it. Uh, but again, I, I, I'd like to fly it later, so let's try not to destroy my stuff, please. So this is shelling out on a smart drone. Uh, I'm Kevin Finisterre. I'm Mike Broncato. Uh, this talk is going to primarily be about the 3D Robotics Solo. Uh, there's plenty of other products out there. Uh, generically, this will kind of cover you know, the bulk of what should be applicable to all of them. Again, we've already introduced ourselves. I'm Kevin. This is uh, Mike. Uh, there's kind of an elephant in the room with regards to my involvement in the drone community, um, and I'll address that here briefly. Uh, but in general, the, the dr consumer drone industry has is, is become a, a billion-dollar industry, and there's lots of marketing dollars involved. Uh, the products are proliferating all over the place. You know, Many of your friends have them. I'm sure you guys have them. You've seen them in Best Buy, everywhere else. Um, there's really a number of emerging markets that are popping up as well. You've got farming and agricultural uh, stuff, mapping, surveying, real estate. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty clear that drones are here to stick around. So regarding the elephant, uh, go ahead and talk about that a little bit now. Uh, I don't fall inside the typical mar marketing demographic. I usually speak up against uh, inconsistencies and I really don't settle for bad code. Uh, and, and as such, I've been banned from one of the main communities called DIY Drones. Um, I've been banned multiple times, quite honestly. Uh, I've also had a couple of uh, drone satire accounts that poke fun at the various vendors and, and push them to write better code, uh, banned from Twitter recently. Um, vendor dubbed user error isn't something that generally flies with me. I really push back against that. So a lot of the marketing teams flat out, they, they just hate me. So that's the elephant in the room regarding this talk. I'm not apologetic about that at all. Um, it, it's generally for the, the, the good of the industry and the people that are buying these things. Uh, for this talk specifically, it, it's not really relevant. Uh, there's plenty of technical information that you guys are welcome to dispute uh, if, if you think it's applicable. I actually do own this product. I'm not just one of the random folks that's flapping my gums about it because I don't like the vendor. I've flown it, I know quite a bit about it, and I've got some history with them as well. Um, I own the Ninja Turtle backpack deal, as you can see down here, so I, I am an actual end user. So I'm Mike Broncato. My point in this is really, I've been, I'm, I have a lot less experience with drones than KF. Uh, I kind of got into them after working with KF on some stuff. But when I started looking at them, I started looking at some of the protocols and some of the telemetry and RC systems and thinking, there's just no security here. There's, there's implementations to, to work around interference, but there's no security in them at all. And so I start, started to talk to KF about maybe trying to attack those and look at them. And so we have some things to, to show you to go on about, about that. But Yeah, stay away from Mikey Bites, and uh, I hear he's radioactive, so um, he's not your average monkey. So why are we doing this stuff? Um, I honestly, I kind of played into the marketing a little bit. This is supposedly the first smart drone, so we're technically the first smart drone hackers. Um, obviously, there's internet memes about people who are actually first. I don't know if I'm really the first. I'm sure there's plenty of people that don't talk about stuff. Uh, I'm also kind of a consumer advocate in this arena. I've bought a lot of this equipment. A lot of it's garbage. A lot of it doesn't live up to the marketing. And I like to share my experience with people that will subsequently buy into this stuff as well. It's, it's flat out not cheap. Also, an element of safety uh, concerns in this stuff. You're, you're literally looking at a flying lawnmower. Uh, so it's, it's pretty obvious to figure out what happens when you've got something with large rotating blades that you know may have bad code on it. Yeah, it's easy for people to think that, okay, we can have these drones be shot out of the sky or whatever, but the reality of it is they are very dangerous, especially you know, propellers and crowds. They just do not mix. There's an element of software development lifecycle and QA that goes into this as well. I'm kind of a stickler on those things. Uh, you know, if somebody's going to sell me something and they claim it's robust, 
it, it just flat out better be robust. I had an issue with this craft here where uh, I was flying in manual mode, yet it was uh, too stupid to determine that I wanted it to land on its own. It has a landing detector that apparently was broken that wouldn't detect me landing properly. Subsequently set my gear flying to the side of a bridge. I burn out one of the motors because the crash detector also didn't work. So again, pointing back to this development life cycle, I don't know whose job that was, but they flat out didn't do it. Again, people ask us all the time, why are we doing this stuff? And uh, to me, there's no shortage of idiots out there. Uh, we've seen, you know, this, this drunk uh, agent crashes DJI Phantom into the White House. We've got folks tossing bricks of meth and coke over the border and into prisons and whatnot with this, with this equipment. Um, apparently, when you buy a Phantom, a rite of passage is to go fly the thing in an airport. I don't know what that's all about, but, you know, please, when you guys buy these things, stop doing that. It's, it's really giving the hobby a bad name. We've seen some protests in Japan. Uh, we had a gentleman that strapped a piece of radioactive material to a phantom again and sent it over a, a government building, I think during some sort of nuclear negotiations on proliferation and whatnot, obviously was kind of sending a message. Um, we've also had some contrived threats from our own Department of Homeland Security. They've attached C4 and other explosives to the bottom of a, a phantom and implied that somebody could do something terrorist with it. Uh, anybody that's actually flown these things would probably roll their eyes at it as they realize it's not very realistic of a scenario. Uh, we've also got folks that are attaching guns to these things. Uh, a couple months back, we had a guy put a 9mm on a quadcopter. It was all through the news as, you know, super scary. Um, again, uh, we, we've seen, you know, 38 sub nose pistols, all kinds of fun stuff attached to, to this gear. Um, as early as 2008, we even had a guy that took a, uh, a Bergen helicopter, uh, it's a small gas chopper, and put a 9mm on the front of it with a, a servo actuator, and he's out in the backwoods somewhere popping off shots with the thing. So, you know, my opinion, seeing guns attached to copters really isn't anything new. It's been done before. Uh, but again, as far as the media and, you know, coming up with scary new things to talk about and start banning things, you know, this is the sort of stuff those folks love to see. Uh, and again, recently, you know, we've seen at the U.S. Open, somebody ditched this actual craft here, the 3DR Solo, crash into the stands at the U.S. Open. I don't know what that guy was thinking. Um, but again, uh, th these things are becoming a problem from the standpoint of, you know, you've got idiots flying them everywhere. Uh, because of that, you know, we're winding up with a, a, a legitimate market for drone forensics and lit litigation as well. So, you know, if, if you're interested in, you know, a new emerging market around drones, this is something really interesting to look into. Uh, as such, drone detection and denial uh, is popping up quite frequently now. Uh, there's also some controlled interdiction uh, that's coming up as an option. Uh, if, if you Google around, you'll find several companies that are doing this stuff. Uh, drone detector is one that I think is doing it better than some of the others. Uh, but again, there's a number of folks that are looking into this stuff. Yeah, and I think if you look out there, you'll see that there's some sort of uh, empirical evidence that the government is interested in using this as well for both a denial and an interdiction uh, for, for use for both of those. And again, I go back to the safety aspect. I know I've talked to KF about the orientation of the pilot who takes over or what you do with the drone when you do force it out of the sky, what are you forcing it into? And that's part of what we're talking about here. Yeah, there's a lot of logic involved in, in understanding how to take control of something successfully and, and not doing it where you're going to harm somebody else. So when I wrote my initial paper on the 3DR Solo, one of the first groups to download it was AMR Deck, and that's the U.S. Army's Aviation and Missile Research Development Engineering Center. And if you Google AMR Deck and drones, you'll find they have a platform that they're trying to create uh, to, to you know, serve military bases and stuff like that for uh, you know, interdiction and, and denial, basically. Uh, Boeing also has a, a laser that they can shoot stuff out of the air. Uh, and, and to Mike's point here multiple times, uh, one of my friends said, you know, the only thing better than a falling drone is a falling burning drone. So again, I don't know what the use case for that is, but if you think back to the US Open where that 3DR solo was there, you know, a solo landing in the stands, not as big of a deal, but a, a fireball landing in the stands is kind of a bigger deal. A little lipo on it. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, and if you guys aren't familiar with lipos, they are highly flammable and oftentimes explosive, and, and most drones have them on them. 
So again, these platforms are popping up all over the place. They're not just low grade, you know, consumer products. Uh, there's some military grade hardware that, that's, that's popping up to stop this sort of stuff. So it's, it's really a large emerging market. Drone forensics is also becoming a thing. Uh, David Kovar, Kovar on Twitter, DC Kovar, is, is a good resource to follow. Uh, there, there's a lot of physical evidence on this equipment. So, you know, if you're looking at, for example, one of these folks that has tossed a brick of coke over the border, um, you know, a lot of times DHS wants to know where that came from. Uh, so if you can get a hold of the aircraft, there may be some artifacts that you can pull off the chips, for example, to help figure out, you know, what was the original flight plan. And fortunately, when a lot of these things turn off, the, the flight plans are wiped. So people are wondering, are they, are they actually wiped? Or again, is there some forensic evidence that gets left behind? Um, you've got tablets and laptops that are being used for ground control devices. Uh, and then the radios themselves, this one on the floor actually has a Linux box inside of it. Um, so again, you're, you're circling back to our traditional, uh, you know, forensic world and, and computer security. And I know like every device is different and we'll talk about it briefly here in a second, but you know, here in Louisville, there was a guy who shot down a drone for spying on his 16 year old daughter and the media his was all over. Daughter, yeah. yeah, yeah. His, Okay, and the media was all over about you know his side of the story, and it wasn't until a few days later that the operator actually came out with his telemetry data and was and was able to map it and say and come out with a completely different picture as far as where his craft was when it was shot. So basically, the story was this dude's daughter was in the pool sunbathing, and this guy came over with his drone and was taking pictures of her. In reality, what he was doing was a real estate shoot for the guy's neighbor that was trying to sell his house. So the, the telemetry actually showed the dude was nowhere near the backyard and was, you know, basically corroborated his story. So again, uh, David Kovar is a good resource for that stuff. Uh, he's got a, a, a talk at, at SANS that, that dives into some of these concepts. Uh, one of the targeted concepts is the real-time analysis. So if you actually do crack into a drone, you might be able to uh, take over the telemetry stream. And from there, you can extract things like the GPS location of the craft itself, in some cases, the operator and, and some other things that might help you locate uh, who's there. Uh, what drone was that? That's, uh, that's out of a DJI Phantom. So that's the sur to net protocol. Um, they, they basically take serial and, and write it out over UDP packets. It's real trivial to decode. Um, privacy concerns is another reason that we kind of looked into this research. You know, again, people are freaking out about what can a drone do if it's flying over my house or flying over my yard. Um, so, you know, as, as Mike mentioned, we, we had that gentleman here in Kentucky that, that swore somebody was spying on his daughter. Um, last year, we actually had a, a, a kid that got beat up at a beach uh, for flying a Phantom. And uh, <laughs> he had video on his chopper, this lady walking up to him and like assaulting him. It's, it's pretty funny if you watch it. Uh, so that pistol drone a couple slides back, oddly enough, the same kid made that pistol drone. So I would probably think twice about accosting that dude next time he's flying over my yard. Uh, in Colorado, we had a, a small town that was selling drone hunting licenses. So uh, it turned out to be garbage and it wasn't legit, but I, I do have one and it's signed by the local uh, uh, head of city council or something like that. Uh, there's also companies uh, popping up selling drone loads for shotguns. So uh, again, the marketing is, is, is jumping full force on this. <clears throat> I think another interesting aspect of this uh, that, that kind of led me to want to research is the fact that you've got police, military, and actually militants themselves making use of this off-the-shelf equipment uh, that, that's subsequently enabling them to survey or counter-survey somebody. Um, so that's interesting in and of itself, again, considering the fact that it's off the shelf stuff and any one of you can pick it up and reverse it and potentially find a flaw in it. So uh, you would be foolish to think that police departments aren't buying phantoms and solos and other off the shelf stuff and, and, and using it because they are. Um, so honestly, uh, some of this research, I just kind of, I want to steal me an Amazon Prime drone. Uh, and maybe Jackson packages, uh, and, and some of these guys are, are, are moving drugs, so you know, none of this stuff is cheap, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal some of this. Uh, you, you've, you've seen the Amazon ads where they're talking about uh, you know, moving packages in certain cities. I think they're actually doing trials, I forget where. Uh, DHL is also doing the same thing. Uh, in, in parts of Africa, Matternet is experimenting with uh, pharmaceutical drugs 
and delivery to places where infrastructure is denied. So you don't have any roads, but you can fly something out there. And even in the U.S., we recently had the first pharmaceutical delivery. That's true. That's true. I think there was a, 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 a delivery of uh, birth control um, from Poland to a neighboring country that you know birth control was illegal in, just kind of, again, to prove a point. Um, but if you go to San Francisco, uh, you can go to trees.delivery and, and get you some dank nugs through a drone. So, uh, you know, again, I, I think if you're in San Francisco, it would be a, a, a lucrative project to maybe hijack some of those deliveries. Um, so uh, drone command and control. All right, so command and control are basically, in, when you're talking like legacy, not smart class, as Kevin puts it, uh, drones, you're talking about the radio control, and you're talking about telemetry. Uh, old school drones, they have these AM and FM. Uh, we have a Futaba example here, these 27, 49, 72 megahertz uh, radio controllers. They're usually three, four, five channel maybe. This is stuff your grandpa might have laying in the yeah. garage or, you know, those of us that, that played with these things when we were, you know. Four <laughs> <laughs> so on the right here, on the right uh, you've got a spectrum. Now this is kind of what I would say is the, kind of the best in class today as far as what most people are trying to run. It's 2.4 gigahertz. It's basically a frequency hopping spread spectrum. It's using a Cypress chip. Uh, which a lot of the different transmitters are using today. Um, when you talk about telemetry, uh, this is an example of the 3DR. 3DR uses 433 or 900 megahertz radios. They have their own frequency hopping algorithm that they calculate. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, but additionally, from RC standpoint, you have long-range systems. Uh, those are usually operating in UHF as well. And usually those are coupled with FPVs, and these can operate in a number of different frequencies, you have to kind of figure out which is best based on your, your operating environment. But this allows you to maintain a visual from the from the craft while you're operating it, you know, well over maybe a half mile or a mile away. So the main point here is, is, is across the spectrum, there's a number of different options as far as frequencies go that may enable you to do certain things. And various pilots are picking various frequencies to enable their, their piloting experience. And every craft is different. It could be set up differently from the channels, et cetera, to what type of frequencies or you know, protocols you can use. So some of the newer stuff, again, like this 3D Robotics uh, smart drone, they're, they're making use of, of common Android tablets and, and iPhone, iOS devices. Uh, and, and they're, they're, they're in essence using the standard Wi-Fi connectivity to, to provide that pilot experience for you. Uh, and some of them are also enabling the cellular connection uh, to, to be enabled while you're flying. So uh, think of malware on your phone or your tablet. Um, that, that's generally a problem as it is. But when you think of the fact that you might be using that tablet or phone to fly your drone, I think that's a you know, more significant problem from the fact that somebody might you know, knock, yourself, knock your stuff out of the air or steal it or whatever. So at this point, you're, you're, you're probably game for, for messing around with some of this stuff, and it's really trivial to do so. Uh, you can dive in with the uh, Edis Research USERP, which is uh, pretty standard for expensive software-defined radios, uh, or you can go the poor man's route and use the RTL-SDR. Uh, either way, either one of these products will allow you to cover a good chunk of the spectrum uh, of frequency and, and, and begin working with these radios and, and, and telemetry devices. Uh, the Hack RF1 is another in the same line of products. It's, it's a little bit more affordable, kind of in between those two on the last slide. Um, but again, uh, if you've been paying attention in, in the radio scene, uh, we've got folks like Travis Goodspeed and, and, and Mike Osman that have been uh, putting out wonderful tools for us. And the IME is one of those tools that came out uh, that, that allowed uh, sub-gigahertz radio analysis to occur. So you could theoretically use the IME uh, as a means to pick up drone communications. Uh, as you go to these conferences, people are handing out badges, and a lot of these badges have built-in radio chipsets. Uh, this is the, the Next Hope uh, 12 badge that, that has an NRF 24L01 built on, and that'll allow you to do Bluetooth frequencies, for example. Uh, so again, you're looking at various dev kits that could enable you as an attacker to, to, to hone in on a lot of these signals. RFCAT is, is, is something I mentioned previously. It's a real popular... Uh, sub gigahertz or, or, or lower radio uh, toolkit, uh, and, and you can make use of it from a, a variety of hardware platforms. The TI Chronos watch makes use of the equipment. 
Uh, so you could make an application that ran on your watch that might help you identify when a drone was around. Um, also, uh, the, the standard way of doing it was the EMK dongle, which is known as Don's dongle. Uh, that was the original RF cat device. And, and now Mike Osman has the Yardstick 1, which is kind of a refined uh, re revision of that. Uh, additionally, the Ubertooth 1, also from Mike Osman, is something you could make use of. Uh, this is a 2.4 gigahertz radio system, so keep it in mind that a lot of the modern systems are making use of 2.4 gigahertz. You could use that to uh, sync up with the spectrum radio or, or something along those lines. Now, the other thing you can do is, is you can take the vendor's hardware and, and use it against them. And that's one of the things that, that Mike has done for this talk, so I'll let him brush up on that a little bit. Yeah, so basically we'll talk about taking the firmware that was used in 3D Robotics' own radios and using that to be, be able to take over another drone that you're not supposed to be connected to by connecting and figuring out their frequency hopping spread spectrum. And it does this by actually identifying the net ID, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, but that's the only way to secure the... The, the communication for telemetry for 3D robotics. So this is a video of Mike making use of the GNU radio toolkit with one of the random software defined radios and uh, he's using it to pick up the the hopping sequence on a spectrum radio. So when it launches you'll basically see uh, you know a visualization of that spectrum. So this is the first step in in, in beginning to start attacking a radio. Yeah and so you can see where the channels actually are uh, with enough analysis you can figure out what the pattern is. That, and I'll keep in mind that's the RC system so you have to figure out how to connect to it. There's a, a unique identifier as well that's on the chip um, and then trying to figure out how to take control. This is an example of frequency hopping for the telemetry radio. It's a whole lot simpler. There's only a few channels being utilized at one, uh, in any, for any uh, radio. And once you're connected, you have the ability to programmatically change what the drone is doing. So again, uh, circling back to what's inside a lot of this equipment, it's all common RF circuits. So things that are applicable in the community now are applicable for drones. It's, it's nothing new. Uh, TI's Chipcon radio interface, you find it all over the place. Uh, somebody mentioned smaller toy drones in the audience, and uh, this AMICOM uh, is, is, is the chip that you'll find in a lot of those toys. If you take apart the Radio Shack stuff or the things that a lot of people give out for Christmas toys, the you know uh, sub hundred dollar range drones and whatnot, this is the vendor that you find inside of there. Um, Cypress is another popular vendor. You've probably seen them before in the USB space. They make a USB serial adapter, which is in a lot of equipment. So Spectrum as a vendor uh, has, has basically used this wireless USB chipset uh, to transmit uh, data to the drones. Um, Nordic Semi, again, we, we've seen this stuff before in the community. It's the same stuff that was in the New Hope badge. Um, so again, obviously, if the vendors are using it for their communication and you have one in a New Hope badge, it's probably pretty trivial to figure out how to you know, make your own firmware. Um, deviation is an open source radio firmware uh, for a, a, a Devo 7E and a couple other radios that are out there. Um, and essentially what you can do is take a lot of these chips that I showed you in the previous slides and embed them into this, this deviation transmitter. And the open source gives you the ability to drive the radio and, and subsequently talk to things legitimately. So in, in my opinion, this is almost the perfect attack platform uh, if you want to get into developing your own attack radio system. Yeah, and so for RC attacks, it, it really is because we already know from the, I mean, from the open source you know, devi deviation software how to legitimately utilize, use it to control a drone. What you can do from that is to actually go back into the source code, look at how the the protocol is protected, and try to figure out ways to attack it. So it provides both the platform to do it, and also a lot of the information we need to figure it out. Because it's been a lot of random people that just that just contribute to deviation to allow it to do DMS or, or DSM and DSMX, and you know all the different protocols. There's another platform out from One Bit Squared, which is a, a member of the Paparazzi project, which is popular auto autopilot uh, project and they create a Cypress CYRF radio set dev kit which will allow you to do main in the middle attacks. So uh, you, you can in essence pick this up and utilize it as your platform for attacking uh, one very specific type of radio. So we're going to dig in uh, to some 3DR specific stuff now and we're going to start with the legacy 3DR products which are their 433 radios. Um, 
they utilize something called Mavlink. Yeah, so Mavlink is a generic ser overlying serial protocol that allows commands that are defined within the Mavlink protocol to be sent back and forth between a ground station, which is usually a computer, and the drone itself. And you can issue commands that like waypoints, throttle, you know, all kinds of stuff. And it's used by a number of different vendors, and parrots using them, uh, as well as almost everything that came out of the 3DR line and all of Lawrence Meyer's stuff. Um, this is basically what a generic serial uh, packet looks like. On the wire, there's a one byte header that just defines the protocol version. There's a length, length byte, there's a sequence byte, which that just increments uh, so that it knows when it loses a packet. System and component IDs are usually just one, um, and, and they don't, you don't have to authenticate to them. Um, and then the payload itself is really just the command that's the, the Mavlink command that's been uh, encoded and has this, it has a CRC at the end as well. So the, the the whole protocol has been a problem for the project for quite a while, and I, I think this developer John Arn Berklin really framed it quite well in in calling it a cat and mouse game for the project. And uh, the, the thing is, is, is genuinely that it, it's not something that they really care about. They, they look at their, their project as a hobby grade project. Um, the, the interesting thing about that for me is the fact that they're now pushing industrial products and you know, consumer products that are supposed to be available to the masses. So you kind of step out of that, hey, we're just a hobby project in, in my opinion. So this has really been a hot topic across a variety of the RF links uh, that the project has used. Originally, they used to make use of ZigBee connectivity, and they would recommend that you set the encryption bit to zero, or EE equals zero, and that was because there were bandwidth concerns. Um, in my opinion, the bandwidth concerns are probably a little less than the security concerns, but you know, what do I know? So th th this, in essence, uh, you know, there's a large swath, not a swatch, since I can't spell on this slide, large swath of uh, impact in the, in the legacy product line for 3DR. The current product line, uh, you know, before the, the smart stuff with the Solo uh, has made use of this, this Hope RF line. Yeah, and even their, their, the Solo came out, what, late last year, early this early year? Early this year. Yeah, and before that they had the Iris, and even the Iris uses these same radios uh, and their Pixel flight controller for 3D robotics. But I can, I can tell you right now that there's very little room to grow with these products. The, the firmware is basically using all the memory space available. Uh, on, the, on the, the embedded RC, RF module, and all they do is they just take this module from Hope RF and they put it onto a board that has serial and an antenna. So it's literally they're just clear text passing their their protocol uh, through the air, and if you know you're smart enough to, to sync up with it, you're good to go. There's there's zero support for encryption at the hardware level. Uh, additionally, uh, the, the Mavlink protocol itself was never designed with security in mind. So a, a number of people have started noticing. Uh, that there are vulnerabilities and they might be attractive. Yeah, and if you look at this research paper, which is really good, by the way, um, it, it'll talk about the ability to take over both listening and also actively attacking the telemetry, telemetry link for a Mavlink radio. And he's got in here some analysis about packet loss, et cetera, to help you figure that out. And we've actually experienced that in our testing. Uh, but, the, but this is a really good overview of uh, an analysis of the Mavlink protocol and how it's being used today. But again, the main point here is that this is a military group that's looking at this stuff. So, you know, if the military is interested in your toys, they're probably being used for more than just toys. Um, a lot of this stuff just really hasn't been discussed publicly. I don't know if it's because there's people that aren't doing it or if they're just keeping it to themselves. But one of those few people is, is Hugo Sayo. And at RootedCon in 2012, he discussed some of the nuances that he found in the Mavlink protocol. And one of those nuances was in the serialization and how they handled the links. Basically, he found a standard buffer overflow that he was able to exploit. And uh, in, in, in this platform, what that means is you could, for example, do uh, you know an ROP payload, payload and uh, tell your craft to return to home. But instead of return to home for the pilot, you set it to your address or your car. So you, you know, exploit the link and tell somebody's drone to fly to your car so you can make off with it. Uh, there, there's, again, very few people talking about how to hijack drones. And uh, this, this madhacker.org is one of those, you know, small handful I can count on, on a couple of fingers. And uh, he, he notes specifically that in 3DR land that the net ID is the only thing that's really protecting you uh, from, from being abused. 
Yeah, and the net ID is used both to, it's, it's seeded in the SRAN function and see, everybody knows what that is, but uh, to generate the channel pattern and it goes, it cycles through this channel pattern. But additionally, it's used to generate a base frequency so that every channel is, is then based off of that initial frequency. So they take the very absolute minimum frequency and then they add this base frequency uh, onto it. So that you need to know both of those things to be able to sync up correctly. So over the years, uh, a secure Mavlink implementation has come up a number of times. And if, if you look at the date on this paper, it's, it's 2013. And uh, it, it's pretty clear at this point there's no widespread usage of secure Mavlink in sight. Um, so I, I don't know what they're eventually going to do. But the, the, the route to get to a secure Mavlink is pretty clear. Unfortunately, people keep beating a dead horse and, and they're not really reading into it. So Witness Digital mentions specifically here that the way to solve it is to use a better STM32 chip, the one that fits the same footprint and actually has AES support built in. It, it, it's a no-brainer. We've known this for a number of years. Uh, but again, the, the conversation keeps coming up. You know, here's an RFC that's moving towards secure Mavlink. And they talked about this for weeks on end on how we can make Mavlink secure and again, they came back to the fact that, hey, this, this Atmel processor that's driving everything just can't do it. and It's never going to do it. So I've seen a couple of people that have come up with uh, hackish workarounds, if you will. This is the Syria Airlift project. project. And what they do is uh, they're delivering humanitarian aid in, in, in a conflict zone using RG Pilot software. And uh, they, they've come up with a, quote, security handshake, which I don't put much faith in. Um, and, and basically what they've claimed is they have a custom handshake between the plane and the ground control station that allows you to, to sync up. Um, we have pretty much already determined that it's really trivial to sniff that stuff, so it's, you know, not very useful. Uh, you know, another person in that same line of thought is uh, this, this mad hacker gentleman. He, he's released a crypto telemetry firmware. The fun thing about is though about it is uh, he blatantly mentions the source is not open. Uh, the secrets are permanently stored inside, and opening the source will give the values of give clues of possible attack vectors. So it's like it's yeah, whatever, dude. Are you serious? You want me to pay seventy five bucks for this? So uh, you know, again, I'm going to continue beating the dead horse. Uh, Tridge, the main three D robotics uh, developer. Uh, November of this, this past year came up and said, hey guys, really the right thing to do is to buy the proper radio that supports the encryption. So Tridge gets a gold star. We've been saying this for four years now. As far as a, a, an actual takeover of a flight using this protocol and these, these unencrypted radios, there, there's a set of mechanics that go along with it if, if you're working with 3DR specific equipment. And I'll let... Uh, yeah, so like every, again, every craft is different. But with this, this is the Mad Hacker website again. He talks about doing a flight termination. He talks about turning off the drone's ability to send packets back to the ground station. So that way, the person who's really supposed to be controlling, controlling the drone doesn't know that you've changed the flight mode, doesn't know that you've set a waypoint or anything like that. And that's what he's getting into is, you know, doing the flight termination or setting waypoints. But it all varies from craft to craft. And what we'll talk about today is really with, with what we did, the termination actually wasn't implemented, so we actually just did a reboot. We just rebooted the flight controller, it caused the thing to just you know, stop. So getting back to the solo itself, and I'm really disappointed I'm not hearing this thing like deauth or anything like that. Like, come on, guys, try harder here. Um, basically, say it again. Uh, it has a standard WPA Wi-Fi connection. It's up and running right now. So there's there is telemetry going back. It's it's pulling GPS down. And it's yeah there is. It, it's not 433 telemetry though. So uh, you know again if I if I said Kismet and Aircrack would own this thing, you'd probably not believe me, but that actually is the case. So 3DR marketed this thing as a secure Wi-Fi link as far as the the, the control uh, system for it. They call it Solo Link. It's literally nothing more than a, a host APD implementation running WPA. Uh, in the quick start guide, uh, they tell everybody to use the default password, which is solo link. So if you ever reset the equipment, it's always solo link. And they never tell you to change it, which is awesome. So I know there's a lot of people that still have it set as solo link. Yes? Yes, you are. Yep. Um, so uh, Kismet and Aircrack, again, uh, thank Dragorn if you know him. He put a lot of hard work into Kismet, and it's, it's still useful. Dust off your old alpha. You can, you know, steal yourself a solo with it. 
So uh, really, to me, I, I think it's kind of funny that they're selling this thing as a, quote, smart drone, but it's not even really smart enough to protect the control link. Um, I'm not saying that 802.11w is the end-all, be-all on Wi-Fi security, but at the very least, you could have prevented me from deauthenticating the drone while you're flying it. So again, if you circle back to that U.S. Open incident, uh, anybody in the room with a cell phone could have stopped that drone from entering that airspace. It was really stupid easy because it was, again, a 3DR solo. Um, I'm not going to demo WPA cracking. It's been in our community for quite a while now. It's nothing special. So uh, same same with the deauth attack. In, anybody in here can do that very trivially. trivially. Um, but again, uh, the main thing is once you've done that, you're more or less you're on the link for the equipment. It's pretty trivial to take over from there. So we're gonna go into some demos now. And the, the, the caveat here is I'm not gonna fly this thing here. It's not really safe for me to do that. I'm not trying to pay for any of you guys' hospital bills or anything like that. Um, <laughs> additionally, uh, there, there's been a number of folks that have talked at conferences lately that have used uh, AR drone uh, as their attack platform. So I'm, I'm not gonna do this either. Uh, Anybody can tell net into an open Wi-Fi link and subsequently, uh, you know, halt the platform. I don't even know that it's worth flicking through these, but these, these are basically common videos that have been out. Uh, this is Sammy. Uh, he wrote a, I think it was called Maldrone. It was an AR drone firmware that would spread to other AR drones. I thought it was kind of funny because, yeah, I've, I've never seen more than one AR drone in like, you know, two or three years time collectively. So I don't know how this thing is going to spread, but you know, whatever. Um, and again, this, this, this just popped up at uh, DEF CON this, this, this past month or so. Just again, somebody telnetting in and, and, and shutting it off. So this isn't really spectacular to me. So I'm going to let Mike talk about his firmware uh, called Sickening, which is an attack platform for the 3DR, 433, and 900 megahertz radios. So SICK is a software, it's an open source firmware that they use on these Hope RF, RF modules that are in the telemetry radios that are both on board the drone and at your computer that you're using for a ground station. And what I've done is basically taken the firmware and changed how it, in, how it initializes so that it, it basically hops through the different frequencies or through the different channels and tries to identify a Golay encoded header. And when it does that, then I'm able to extract information that would let me figure out what the net ID is. Once we do that, then we just reinitialize the, the radio with the correct net ID and then take over on the correct frequency hopping uh, order. And so this is just uh, some screenshots I sent to KF on Twitter where I had set the net ID on my attacker's radio to 47 and then plugged it in, powered it up uh, with the drones active around as well, and it correctly figured out the net ID of 25, which is the default. So, uh, and then this is just a screenshot of where we talked about maybe issuing a terminate command of adding that into something like map proxy so that you can use map proxy to connect to via your radio and issue these terminate commands. But the caveat here is that the craft has to actually support it, which the stable version of Articopter that I had doesn't. So in, in essence, what, what he's been able to do is take a rogue radio and brute force the the key to join the network and created himself as, as a rogue entity on this network. And from there, he can send commands to the other end because there's no authentication. Once you're part of the network, you can just you can toss packets out. So he's in essence uh, you know, connecting to the protocol handler on the back end of the drone and just telling it what to do. Uh, the only caveat that we've run into is there's some collisions in, 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 you know, the original ground control station in your rogue station, which is why the other gentleman, the mad hacker, was, was discussing how to prevent the ground control station from re replying back to you and, and, and kind of making the environment a little bit more uh, conducive to the attack itself. And in that research paper that we showed a little while back, he actually talks about that interference and a lot of packet loss. And that's one thing we experienced. The other issue is like the radios were all within like three feet of each other. So, uh, but here basically what I'm doing is, is showing, uh, plugging in the, uh, the, the radio with sickening on it and setting the net ID or showing that the net ID is not correct, which the correct net ID in this case I believe is 475, but I'm just setting it to the default, which is 25. Uh, and then I unplug it and show the correct uh, ground control radio and show what its net ID is. And then what's going to happen basically is going to fire it up, pretend like I'm flying, I'm going to launch it with a... Uh, with the transmitter here, 
and then plug in and reboot the device, causing it to basically stop all the motors and fall from the sky. So if we had the speakers turned up, you can hear he's got the throttle cranked up, and you know when the when the reboot is injected, the throttle stops. So obviously, if you're flying, you would no longer be flying. And we've got we're gonna post this so you can go and watch all these videos. Yeah, I've already tweeted the the slides to this link on my Twitter account. It's at dot slash d zero t s l a s h. So you guys can you know peruse these videos in your in your own time. This is just the flight controller going nuts. So, but it's an example of something you could maybe have it do if uh, if you took over. Yeah, I don't think this video is going to pull down for whatever reason. But basically, uh, uh, one of the things that we mentioned you could do, you know, if you caught a random RG Copter user on bench working with their equipment, if you wanted to be a jerk, you could just throttle their equipment up and you know put it in acro mode and bang the sticks around or something like that. And in this case, you can see <laughs> Mike almost drilled himself with it. So that was that was kind of cute. Um, so back to the Solo itself, um, again I mentioned they're using Android tablets and, and iOS tablets for the, for the control platform. Uh, so we all know what happens with Android apps, you can take them apart, it's, it's real trivial to do. So uh, JD GUI their app and uh, you see all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, and it, it's, it's real trivial to figure out what to do with it. Uh, the root password is in there in, in plain text. Uh, the SSH address is there. The SSH username is there, which is root, which is awesome because they do everything as root. Um, no, no problems there, clearly. Um, the fun thing about this is, is though, e even though you have the root password, if you changed it or, or fixed the hard-coded password in the app, it kind of doesn't matter because the way they've written everything, there's a bunch of unauthenticated protocols flying all over the solo link basically so uh it, it, it th there's a lot of back-end architectural work that they need to do to make this secure or robust if you will so uh in inside of that that source code there's a couple of, of of tokens that you can borrow and and you know look at some things with one of those tokens is for uh their flight training school which tells you you know how to unbox it and how to do some advanced shots and whatnot nothing really spectacular uh, both of their firmware uh, download channels are there. So the, the Android app makes a request, a JSON response comes back, pulls down a targz file, which then gets written to the drone and onto the, uh, the craft. The only thing verifying is an MD5 that's in the, the JSON that comes down. So if you wanted to spoof that, for example, it's pretty trivial to tell it, hey, download this file and flash it onto the equipment. They also had a weather underground API key in there. Um, which, if you're familiar with Weather uh, Underground, all you need to do is use that API key in the URL when you're making your query. So, thanks for that. I, I appreciate that. Uh, this is the weather for whatever day I wrote the presentation for, for Louisville using their API key. They also have a, a solo beta program, which I'm an unofficial member of. Uh, you're supposed to sign up and then you get access to their APK and whatnot. Uh, but again, uh, if, if you use those API keys that I had mentioned that I found in the source code, you can just make the queries on your own and, and, and pull that stuff down. So there's all kinds of fun release notes in there that are more developer-centric that I don't think they particularly care for everybody to know. Uh, there's one in here mentioning specifically some poor Wi-Fi performance that was causing short-range return to launches. So, you know, you get 100 feet out and your craft just shoots up in the air and then comes back to you, which is very annoying. It's it, great when you're under a tree. Yeah, right? <laughs> they, they did not mention that publicly, of course. But again, if you're looking in the beta notes, it's pretty clear that they were well aware of it. Uh, inside that JSON file, you'll find uh, a, the, the firmware, which is basically a tar -GZ with a squash FS file in it. And they didn't even modify the squash FS. A lot of the routers like flip a bit somewhere or mess up the gzip routine and makes it really annoying to uncompress. This is just straight up regular squash FS. So mount it up and you got access to the file system. Um, and on the file system, you get all of their logic for making this thing smart, as it were. Um, so the fun thing about that is in a lot of their scripts, which are all just Python, uh, they made the mistake of embedding the Google document links for their internal developers. And uh, they've done this like four or five releases in a row and I dime them out every time. I don't know why they keep doing it. Um, so this is a confidential document on GoPro's Hero Bus that they were supposed to be the exclusive vendor or some nonsense like that. So I don't think they cared that I published that because now it's a hidden document again. But again, like I don't, I don't know what you're doing there. So. On the wireless link specifically, um, 
Nick Spiel was one of the lead engineers of the 3D Robotics Project, and about a month and a half after I raised a big stink about them not telling users to change the password, somebody finally comes out and says, hey, you guys might want to change that password. So in his opinion, you can't do any harm if, if you change the password, and I'm not going to debate the semantics around cracking passwords. I know some of you guys are really good at, you know, figuring the trivial dumb things that people do when they create passwords. Um, additionally, uh, I know a number of you guys are, are particularly good at, you know, cracking uh, passwords and whatnot. So I'd be flat out lying if I told you I didn't download the Church of Wi-Fi stuff and, you know, create an, an Amazon EC2 instance. And I think I asked you at least one dumb question here and there. Uh, so basically, uh, I bought the, uh, what was it, the, the G2X Large, which has four GPUs in it. And there's, uh, you know, 1,536 cores uh, inside each GPU, which calculates out to a metric fuck ton of cores. I apologize. Um, so basically, my invoice for two days worth of cracking was 25 bucks. So it's like, okay, that's a no-brainer to play around with that. Uh, I generated some rainbow tables. Um, <laughs> there's basically a finite number of SSIDs that are default, if you will. Most of these users are never going to change it from solo link underscore last for the MAC address. So I just went ahead and generated tables for those. I went and pulled down the Ashley Madison passwords and all the other top 10,000 leaks and all that. And, you know, there, there's some that are not valid WPA passwords, but those that were, I crammed them into my WPA table and it, it works. But again, I'm not, that, that's not my arena, so I'm not going to lecture you on how well that works versus does it. Main point, once you pop the solo link, it's on like Donkey Kong. So um, this is a video of me. Uh, this is the first time that I got comfortable enough to try to fly the solo from my laptop. And it scared the hell out of me. Uh, basically, I wrote an expect script to connect into the Wi-Fi, uh, SSH into the platform, and connect to the... Uh, the map proxy instance is local. And I uploaded a script and told it to take off, basically. Um, I don't know if I can jump this along a little bit. Um, but there were uh, some folks in the field that I was flying in, and I was really uncomfortable with it, but I went ahead and did it anyway. And uh, in essence, it shoots up in the air, takes off, and um, it's literally hovering over these guys that are playing soccer. And I'm like, God, don't fall out of the air. But again, the main point was that I was able to use my laptop to commandeer the solo link and tell the craft to go fly somewhere. Um, so again, eyeballing it, it's nothing really spectacular. It just looks like me running around a field with a laptop, what do you do? Um, if you can't pop the solo link, just, just trash it. I mean, don't let anybody use it. Just de-off it nonstop. So again, this is a video of me. Uh, I'm in a field across the street, same field. This just, again looks like me with a laptop doing whatever. Um, the lights on the solo flash multiple times when the link goes down. So in essence, you see the thing take off. I'm flying it with a transmitter, fire up air crack, and tell it to de-off it over and over and over. As soon as the de-off packets hit, uh, the craft immediately starts flashing. You can see the lights right there. They're flashing red and uh, back and forth. I have, my hands are not on the transmitters, what I'm showing you there, and it's coming back to me. So again, at the U.S. Open, if somebody would have just sat there and de-off all day long, that solo would have never even taken off. Um, so it's extremely trivial to impact the quality of the solo link and prevent somebody from flying. So main point, Nick Spiel's argument, change your password and nobody can do anything. Yeah, whatever. So when these things first came out, I didn't own one. Uh, and I had a friend of mine that actually lives in Texas close to one of the 3DR offices. And uh, I had him uh, go down to where they do a lot of their marketing videos and, and show everybody how cool their new product is. And he sat out there with his laptop and Kismet and sniffed a couple of people flying their brand new solos. So um, they're extremely, uh, they're extremely trivial to find. Um, can be identified by their MAC address and a number of other things. I'm going to try to move through here quickly because we're chewing through time, um, and I need to move through this stuff. So tearing this thing down, again, there are some benefits to doing it. Uh, I tapped on to all of the pins that I saw internally, 
And I found a UART, which I found it very useful to move that UART external. Um, now I can just shell out on the controller anytime I want to. Um, it's kind of like the equivalent of jailbreaking your phone, I guess, if you want to come up with an analogy. Uh, this thing is basically a Freescale IMX6. I now know everything about it. I have bought my own IMX6 development platform, pretty much cloned it. I can additionally modify the closed bits that they've not shared. This is a firmware that actually gets pushed down to the, the screen. So when it boots, instead of saying waiting for solo, I change it to hamster wake up. Real trivial. You can also see I've got a, I've moved my SD card external um, because I got sick of taking the thing apart and I wanted to be able to hot swap firmware whenever I wanted to. So what can we do with access to the transmitter? Uh, a lot of people were asking, is it possible to use this transmitter with other drones? And the developers and the vendor came back and said no. That's, that's nonsense. It's completely legit that you can do that. So what I did was I started sniffing the stream. It's basically a UDP protocol. Um, in essence, what I found was that if I use SCAPI, it's real trivial to, to duplicate the protocol. Um, I, in essence, uh, also found some code on, on the file system that allowed me to, you know, kind of shortcut my development work by utilizing their code to take the packet structure apart. So it's literally timestamp, sequence ID, and then PWM of all the channels. So you can inject anything that you want into the telemetry stream. Uh, you can connect into somebody's transmitter, turn it off, prevent them from accessing it. Um, so again, this is just a Linux box, so I can cut you out of it anytime I want. There's really nothing you can do about it. Likewise, I can take control of it. You know, you're flying it, you don't have any control of it, it's cool, I got you. I got it back in my house now. So uh, for me, the holy grail in this is, again, rooting the Linux instance and running scripts locally, or just generically abusing the fact that the map proxy instance is not authenticated through uh, the 3DR radios, uh, sickening in, in this case. So this screenshot here is actually Mike taking advantage of the sickening issue. Uh, yeah, this is basically here. I've got two different instances, one in a VM that's running Mission Planner, one on my Mac. They're connected with two different radios. One is the sickening radio. It's connected to the mission planner, but they're both connected to the drone, so they both can issue commands, and they're both getting telemetry back. So, again, uh, I, I suggest you abuse 3D robotics users with your newfound knowledge. Um, the best way I can think of doing that is drawing some air peens, um, and uh, you can figure out what that is. If you saw the NASA rover, there's been many greats before me in, in the air peen arena, and they accidentally drew that like whatever dude um, so again uh, this was in Gizmodo a couple years back the dude that drew this with his airplane was apparently the hero that we needed um, so I want to be a hero too uh, this is a subpar uh, you know drawing from 2013 uh, Chris Anderson the CEO of 3d robotics to kind of beat this dead horse uh, went out and uh, went to a local high school and, and, and invited a bunch of 14-year-olds to fly his equipment. And this was apparently the first thing they thought to do with it. So, so again, uh, my rendition of this, uh, I, I basically took, um, I, I, I took a SAR pattern, we'll call it a search and rescue pattern, and I, I transposed it on my local location and then wrote a piece of code that I could go anywhere else in the world and draw the exact same polygon wherever I was. So as you can see here, I've taken my, my air peen and moved it you know, a couple hundred feet up by the track in this particular field. So the way I did that was with some code by a gentleman called Thaddeus Vincenti, and he wrote a paper called Direct and Inverse Solutions of Geodesics on the Ellipsoid with Application and Nested App Equations. And I basically took his code and found an old MATLAB script and converted it to proper Python, which then works with DroneKit. So uh, basically all of that together, the algorithm allows me to, you know, create portable penises in the sky. Um, so again, as far as all this goes, it's obviously some of it's trolling. So what would a proper trolling be without, you know, some, some rip rolling? Uh, so as I mentioned before, there's a flight school application that the users can load up to learn how to fly. And I replaced all of the videos with whatever I want. And in this case, Rick Roll, the end user that's flying on the tablet instead of showing their instructional video. Um, all of the flight side uh, video is all GStreamer. So uh, this stuff is uh, pretty trivial to interface with. 3DR has come out and given you a proper GStreamer pipeline to do this. But a couple months back, they were hiding it all and they weren't telling you. So 
my techniques for more back alley kind of street. Uh, same with the password, they weren't giving it to you before, but now they're sharing and being more open. I've, I've heard partially because of me trolling on it. Um, so again, the main point with the video stream is it's trivial to sniff, redirect, inject, replay. This is me uh, redirecting the packets off the radio to my computer and then and displaying them with GStreamer. There's a lot of tools that can enable that. Uh, video Jack is one. UDP reflector is a specific way I did it by redirecting the UDP port to my IP when I was joined to the SoloLink network. You can additionally use RTP break, uh, which if you've just sniffed the traffic, you can then run RTP break against it and it'll spit out movie files uh, of, of the video session. That comes on Kali Linux and you know any number of stuff. Uh, the last bit of that is, again, on the, on the end user's tablet, uh, you can inject uh, that same GStreamer imagery back onto their tablet where they're using for FPV. So I don't actually have the stream up and running, but you can see the, the, the GStreamer test video flash really quickly. That's that multicolored, you know, uh, that right there. Um, so that's me injecting that on the Wi-Fi link. So if you were flying, you should be seeing the video feed out of the drone, but I can actually push over top of it. Again, I can push that Rick Ashley video if, there, if I really wanted to. So one of the last things to discuss is compiling. Uh, and 3DR really doesn't want you to do that. Uh, they, they mentioned specifically it's not supported in their, in their new development guide. Um, I found some ways around that. You can just take the SquashFS image to root into it and then use it as your development platform. Whole thing is based off of Yocto Linux, so you can just go to Yocto Linux, pull down the, the, the 1.51 RPMs and basically create your own development environment. Uh, I created a dev.sh script which takes all the necessary RPMs and creates that environment for you. Um, I also compiled a number of binaries which are kind of useful for people uh, that are hacking on this platform. They're all available on my GitHub, which is currently private. I'll flip it to open after the talk is over. Um, again, you can get things like strace, gdb, all the stuff you need to find traditional vulnerabilities. Uh, one of the first things I compiled was PAX test, which uh, would help me determine what they did with regards to randomization of the kernel, memory addresses, and whatnot. As you can see from the output, 3DR did nothing as far as protecting the kernel. So, you know, when you do find an exploitation point, it's pretty trivial to, to go through it uh, and, and, and have a lot of fun. So, again, this stuff is uh, basically logic blocks as far as I'm concerned. You can mix and match. Uh, you can stack them all up together. You know, some of you guys should be able to trivially invent your own things. Uh, it took me a while, but I got them to finally abide by GPL, so all the kernel source and everything else is out there. So if you want to push a rootkit out, again, should be pretty easy to do. Um, maybe make a pre-owned firmware image for when their controller is trying to talk to the drone and pull the firmware down. Uh, but again, there's a lot of traditional exploitable vulnerabilities out there. Also, uh, Mike has proven that the RF interface is also something you can abuse, so don't forget about the legacy products. A lot of options. You can DOS, steal the password, hopefully crack it. You might have to use some logic like Prince preprocessor, uh, use your WPA tables. Um, you know, but again, once you've done that, you can hopefully lock the end user out, maybe rickroll them, stream the video, uh, execute a circle around them while you record them, and uh, you know, kind of taunt them a little bit. And then you know, maybe draw Skypeen before you return to home. Um, or you can just be a jerk. If you catch a solo on, on the bench like we showed with Mike, you can just turn it on, throttle it up, and it might wind up drilling somebody in the face, which is probably a bad thing. So again, watch the carnage, have fun. Um, so that's all we've got. Um, and on that note, I'm just going to leave this out here for you guys. And uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions, let us know. I think we're well over time. Yeah.